We just found out why the webcast is down. Um, someone was doing excavation in the front of the hotel and cut the cable. Thank goodness it wasn't the gas line. Um, so they're out there right now digging to try to repair the cable to get so we can get the webcast back up. But third-party damage uh, happening as we speak. If you look at the agenda, we're trying something a little different than this year. We, we've uh, interspersed a number of kind of short sessions. Instead of uh, three or four uh, people up here doing uh, longer uh, um, sessions, we are uh, trying some short, we're calling them uh, food for thought sessions. And basically, uh, and we'll see if Bill and I can pull this off or if we're never going to try this again in the rest of our lives. Um, we're going to try to provoke, it's, it's kind of like if you remember years ago on 60 Minutes, they used to do point-counterpoint. And that's kind of what we're going to do here. And so you don't want to take this too seriously because what you're going to hear is the extreme point on one side and then the extreme point on the other side. And in reality, the, uh, rea the, the reality is the truth lies somewhere in the middle, probably closer to my middle than to Bill's middle, I'm suspecting, but uh, um, we'll find out. Um, so what we're trying to do is really just kind of get your brains thinking about some key issues so you can discuss it at lunch or during the breaks or whatever, uh, and we're going to move through these fairly quickly. That's kind of why we're doing a, a number of these short food for thought things, just to get thoughts in your mind to discuss. We're not going to try to cover the issue uh, very carefully. The first one that we're doing, and I'm going to lead this off, is the whole idea of uh, how we emphasize consequences. You know, people accuse me of showing up at different conferences all over the country and showing pictures of plumes and explosions and those types of things. They think that's part of my spiel. I don't know where they get this idea because I hardly ever show pictures of, you know, pipeline disasters or anything like that when I'm talking. Um, so, you know, this is really not fair to, to, to say that I do that. Um, Everybody realizes the pipelines are the safest way to move fuel, so, uh, um, but there are consequences to it, and, and I get accused of uh, highlighting the consequences instead of talking about the safety, um, and I don't think that's fair because I hardly ever show pictures of consequences. Um, let's see if I can get through all my pictures of consequences. I don't only show plumes and explosions. I show leaks. I, I, I show injured people. I show environmental damage. Um, so why does the Pipeline Safety Trust think there needs to be a little more emphasis on looking at consequences? Well, one of the things that we see is that the industry often talks about pipeline, whoops, now I've done so many things that it's taken a life of its own here. Um, the industry often talks about pipelines. You'll see this. This is one of the, the new industry organizations, a fairly large group now supported by a lot of companies. And when you go on their website, and this isn't unique to them, when they talk about pipeline safety, there's everybody smiling or there's kids playing in the, on the right of way on top of the pipeline. Um, so they emphasize just the safety side of things, not the consequence side. So what's wrong with don't worry, be happy? Well, what's wrong with it is if you really believe that there's other stakeholders that are involved with pipeline safety, like the public and emergency, well, I've really uh, pushed too many buttons here, emergency response folks, the public, excavators, planners, local elected officials, if you really believe those people are part of the solution, then you need to talk to them in a way that will get them interested. You know, after the San Bruno tragedy, I was at an NTSB hearing, and, and there was shock around the country because the, because the uh, uh, fire chief from San Bruno stood up and said he didn't really realize there was a pipeline running through that neighborhood. He um, uh, um, hadn't paid that much attention. And all of a sudden, the blame was all on that poor fire chief instead of where was the industry talking to those fire chiefs about pipelines running through their neighborhoods. Um, and if you look on some of the industry stuff where they're reaching out trying to get fire chiefs to talk, think about pipelines, here's the smiling fire people and the lead-in thing on the brochure that they send out is pipelines are the safest, most reliable way to transport natural grass, crude oil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, fire people are pretty busy. And if the, the, what they see on the brochure is pipelines are safe, don't worry, be happy, why would they pay any more attention to that? They got a lot on their plate. If you want to get people's attention, you need to talk a little bit about the consequences. 
Same goes with local government employees, whether that's elected officials like myself. Uh, I get the mailers from the pipeline. Boy, I don't know what I've done to the... Uh, I get the mailers from the pipeline companies, and it t tends to lead in with smiley faces and telling me how safe pipelines is. I've got a pile of stuff and people wanting me to talk about a whole range of things on my desk. Why would I dig any deeper into pipelines if the first message is how safe they are? Same with local planners. Local planners tend to do stuff that they're getting permit fees or something to work on. Lots of issues. If the first thing you're telling a planner is all's good, be happy, why would they pay any more attention to pipelines? You need to talk about the consequences to get their attention. Uh, same thing with excavators. Yeah, excavators, I've been, I was a contractor for a number of years, and contractors' time is money. And the same goes for people who are running PowerPoint things. Um, if you want to talk to contractors, you have to give them a clear reason why they should pay attention whether it's their reputation, or the damage they could be liable for, or whatever. If you show them a, a smiling face of somebody sitting on a backhoe, why would they read any more of the brochure? Public should be the best friend of the pipeline companies. There's hundreds of thousands of miles of right-of-way in this uh, country running through people's backyards. Uh, the public should be the eyes and ears. Even the recent uh, leak detection study that, that Linda was talking about shows the public finds more leaks than anyone else. Um, so the public should be the eyes and ears of the company. They really should take that seriously, even if they're annoyed that there's a pipeline in their yard or you're, they think that you're uh, using their property. Uh, the pipeline ought to, the public really ought to be involved. The way you can get the public involved is make sure they understand what the consequences are so they will be those eyes and ears for the industry. Um, and the pipeline industry, more than anybody else, really needs to start thinking about the consequences and remind themselves of that over and over again. Oh, they just ruined my punchline. Um, you know, oftentimes I go to industry conferences where you're in an echo chamber where the industry talks over and over again about the safety of pipelines, and I think they start believing that. And it's the truth. Pipelines are safe. The chance of one failing is really, really small. But the consequences, as a number of the public here can tell you, is huge. So every integrity management engineer, every executive, governmental, or public affairs specialist ought to have this picture on their desktop to remind them that there are consequences, even when, in the rare instance when something goes wrong. So that's my spiel on why consequences matter. Now Bill's going to tell you why I'm full of it.